Hello everyone, welcome to our Bible study for this week as we continue to talk about Christian basic training. Today we're going to be discussing the teaching, the doctrine of security, and what that has to do with Christian basic training. Before that, let me encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Creekside Students at Abbots Creek, where we post these weekly Bible studies. Also check us out on Instagram. Uh, our Instagram page at Creekside Ministry for updates and devotionals. And then, if you would like to be a part of our weekly Tuesday night Zoom room gatherings, we have a devotional and games and pray together. Let me know, send me a text or an email. We'll get that invitation out to you. That's every Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. These are just ways we gather while we can't gather. And uh, hopefully, Lord willing, We'll be gathering in a normal way sooner rather than later, but until then, stay plugged in. Um, I'm going to go to the Lord in prayer, and then we're going to dive right in talking about security. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness to us. We thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for all we have in him and through him and because of him. And it's my prayer, Father God, that you would have your will and way in this Bible study time, that you would bless, that you would encourage hearts that might be feeling a little discouraged. And Lord God, may my words go forth with clarity, and Lord, that you would just um, oversee it all. Uh, Lord God, we need you desperately. I know there are many requests represented in those that are viewing this Bible study. Uh, Lord, I pray you would minister to them in a mighty way with your grace. Help us to put our trust completely in you. Um, help us to do that which we you've called us to do. Well, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, for the last several weeks, we've been talking about uh, this concept of Christian basic training. And uh, last week, we talked about how a person becomes a Christian. If you remember, we talked about being enlisted in Christ, becoming a Christ follower, and I tried to boil it down, and if you need a reminder, just check the videos below um, in this series and look at the in the description of the video on enlisting in Christ, where I lay out in more detail uh, a summary of what we shared in that video. But just to really boil it down, there are three basic truths that we need to acknowledge and receive by faith, more than just a head understanding, but really into our lives in order to be a Christ follower. Number one, that you are a sinner. Number two, your sin is a problem that you cannot fix. And number three, Jesus Christ died on a cross for your sin and rose from the dead and putting your faith in him, your trust in him as your sin substitute is the only way to deal with your sin problem. So remember, just because you say, yep, I believe that's all true, doesn't mean you are a Christ follower. So this brings us to our third item of Christian basic training, the assurance of salvation or security. One struggle that a lot of people have, and maybe some of you watching this video, is you have doubts about your salvation. Now this is especially true for many young people, students that are viewing this video, Maybe you made a profession of faith when you were a smaller child. Uh, we have friends from college. She made a profession of faith when she was four. One of my dear friends made a profession of faith when he was five. And many times the testimony we hear in our churches are people who were, you know, really, really bad, involved in really, really sinful activity. They get saved and their life is different. Well, when you're four or five, you really didn't do anything bad. It's not like you were a five-year-old bank robber. Okay, and so if you made a profession of faith when you were young, you might not have that experience of what you were before Christ and what you are now after Christ. And that can cause you to constantly wonder if you really understood, if you truly trusted in Christ, if you really are saved. That's one way in which folks might doubt or you might doubt. Uh, second, maybe there is sin in someone's life that is causing them to question their salvation. Maybe you're out there and you think to yourself, well, I trusted Christ, but I can't seem to conquer this sin. Maybe I'm not really saved. 
And then that causes anxiety, it causes fear, it causes you to question your salvation. Maybe someone told you that you weren't really saved. Or maybe you're out there and you just don't feel saved. You say, well, I made a profession of faith, but I just don't feel saved. I don't feel like I am a Christian. So whatever the reason that you might doubt, the reality is that doubt about one salvation, and we're talking about that specifically, not doubt about God's existence or those types of things. That's a different question. But doubt about one salvation is quite common. And it can be very troublesome for a lot of people. Students that are viewing this, family members, it can paralyze you and your walk with the Lord. So in Christian basic training, one of the core things we need to nail down is our security. Where does that come from? Where does our assurance in Christ come from? Now I'm going to take my cup, take a drink here. It's good water. And I'm going to use this chair off to the side to put my cup on so you're not seeing me constantly bend down. So I'm going to propose, offer you four questions, all right? And if you were sitting in this youth room with me, uh, I would ask for a show of hands. But since you're not here, just I want you to think about these questions. How many of you, whether it's a student watching this Bible study or a parent or grandparent, have ever doubted, doubted yourself, wondered, okay? How many of you right now, at this very moment, as you're watching this Bible study, have doubts? Uh, do you think that it's even possible to be sure of your salvation? or to have security? And how might your assurance or lack of assurance impact your life? So that's the practical question. Now here's the big idea. If I were to boil this Bible study down, here's the big idea as we talk about this. You can be sure of your salvation. You can be sure of your salvation. And there are three reasons you can be sure you're secure. Okay, three reasons you can be sure you're secure. And I'm going to put these in the description of this video in the form of, hopefully in the form of some JPEGs. If not, I'll include them in this video. But one way or the other, I'm going to get these three uh, reasons you can be sure you're secure in the description of this video, just so you can kind of refresh your mind. All right? And I'm also going to write them up on the whiteboard. That's the reason I am... Um, Where's the black marker? There it is. That's the reason I'm over here by the whiteboard, because I want you to get these things down. It's so important. All right. First reason we can be sure that we are secure. First reason. The person of Christ. All right. The, the first reason we can be secure or we can be sure that we are secure, or that we can have security, is the person of Christ. What I mean by that is union with Jesus Christ. Okay? There are a lot of scripture passages that relate to this. The one I'm going to read right now, Romans 8, uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. Listen to this as I read it. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? Now verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Paul is saying us. So Paul is including Christians. He's saying all people who have said, I put my faith in Christ. I've been enlisted in Christ to use our basic training language. That's Paul's including those. Himself as well. He's a believer. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness? or danger, or sword, I'm going to jump down to verse 37, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors 
through him who loved us. For I am sure, there it is, there's our security word, I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us, there's the us again, he's talking to believers, us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Did you get that? You can be sure, just like Paul was in Romans 8, verses 31 through 39, you can be sure you're secure because of the person of Jesus Christ. In Hebrews 13, verse 5, it says that he will never leave us or forsake us. It says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Galatians 2.20, it says that we are crucified with Christ, and Christ lives in me, the believer. Because Jesus Christ is unchanging, eternal God, your salvation is unchanging and eternal. It is grounded in who he is. So get that. Meditate on those verses, Romans 8. Those are great verses because you can be sure. Paul says it there. He said, I am sure of this, that neither, and then he lists those things, can separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ. So the person of Christ gives us assurance of our security in him. Second, the second reason we can be sure that we're secure is the promise of the Word. The promise of the Word. The promise of the, the Scripture, the Bible. Now, you can view our Bible studies that we did a look at the book here on our YouTube channel below. That'll go through a lot of the details about why we can trust the Bible, what the Bible is, how we understand the Bible, and I encourage you to do that because that directly relates to what I'm about to share now and our second reason we can be secure. It's the promise of the Word of God. Either the Bible is true or it's false. There's no middle ground. It can't be partly true and partly false. If it's false, it's false. If it's true, it's true. And here's what, here's just a summary or a survey of a few verses. In Matthew 25, 35, Jesus says, My words will not pass away. In John 5, 24, he says, He who hears my word has eternal life and does not come into judgment. You know, it's his own word. Titus 1, 2, In hope of eternal life, which God who never lies, promised before the ages began. God cannot lie. He has promised us in his word that for those who put their faith in Jesus, they will be given eternal life and cannot perish. Now, it's very simple. Either we believe the promises of God's word or we don't. I want to tell you something. This goes to how you oftentimes feel. So if you're viewing this Bible study and you don't feel saved, you don't feel secure, let me encourage you to put your feelings through the grid of the promises of the Bible. The reformer Martin Luther said it this way, and I, I don't know if I still do, but I used to have this on a, a sticky note in my office. He said, feelings come and feelings go, and feelings are deceiving. My warrant is the word of God, not else, is worth believing. Let your feelings be filtered through the promises of the word of God. It's true. It's reliable. We can trust it. God doesn't lie. He's made the promise to you, no matter how you might feel right now. And if you feel insecure in your salvation, go to God in prayer and ask him to help you 
to remember the promises of the Bible. Reach out to me or another uh, godly uh, adult or friend in your life. You can reaffirm in you the promises of the Word of God. Uh, being in a place of instability or insecurity as it relates to your relationship with God is a horribly uncomfortable place to be. Now, there may be reasons you are feeling this way. As I mentioned before, if there's sin in your life, or if you're living a, in rebellion against God and what he said in his word, or if you're ignoring God, then you're going to feel distant from him. And that may be an indication that there is a problem, but feelings alone aren't determinant of whether you are saved or not. You're saved, you're secure because of the person of Christ, the promise of the word. And third, the power of God. Now, I'm not usually one for alliteration, but this kind of worked out well, so why not? The power of God. So, the third reason you can be sure you're secure is the power of God. That really, we already read that in Romans 8, when Paul, in verses 31 uh, through 34, really emphasizes God, the power of God. He's the one that saves. He's the one that keeps. But... We need to remember this. God is the one who saves you. God is the one who keeps you. Now, I mentioned this last week. We aren't saved because of what we do. We are saved because of what God has done in his son, Jesus Christ. And therefore, since we can't save ourselves, why would it make any sense to think we can keep ourselves saved? God saves God keeps. And Jonah 2.9, Jonah says, Salvation is of the Lord. And John 1, 28-29, listen to this. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Did you notice that? Two times in these verses, both in verse 28 and in verse 29, Jesus affirms that no one can snatch those who put their faith in him out of the Father's hand. 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Who caused it? God did to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. I love that, unfading. I'm going to mention something about that in a minute. Kept in heaven for you, who by God's power, there it is, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. God is the one who saves us. And no matter what may take place, he is the one who keeps us. Let that be an encouragement to you. You don't have the ability, student, mom, dad, grandparent, you don't have the ability to keep yourself saved. Just like you don't have the ability to save yourself. But God keeps you in his hand. And note in the first Peter passage that I read, that Inheritance, that salvation which is in Christ, is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. I love that unfading. There's a lot of things in life that fade away. You get something new. I mean, I'm 42 years old. I got a lot of Christmas presents growing up as a kid, and they all faded away. I don't have them anymore except for one. Um, I have my Buffalo Bill starter coat that I got for Christmas back in 1993. But other than that, all the other Christmas presents, I think they're gone. They faded away. But your salvation doesn't fade. Why? Because God keeps it. He keeps you. The power of God. So I want you to think about this. If it is true that I cannot lose my salvation, then what about the following questions? All right? So I've laid out the three reasons why we can be secure, that we can be assured of our security in Christ. Now let's kind of think this through just for a few moments. Here's some questions. If I can't lose my salvation, does that mean I can do whatever I want? So maybe you're asking, 
right now as you view this, well, Josh, if it's the person of Christ, the promise of the world, the power of God, and I, nothing I can do can separate me from Christ, does that mean I can do whatever I want? Question one or question two. Again, back to the feelings. What if I feel unsure of my salvation? So let's answer those questions if we could. Let's answer the questions about can I do whatever I want if it's not about me? And question two, what about how I feel? All right. First of all, you need to examine yourself. Let me say that. You need to examine yourself. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5 says, Test yourself to see if you are in the faith. 2 Peter 1.10 says, Make certain of his calling. What do you find if you examine yourself? Let's be honest right now. Let's be honest before the Lord. Let's be honest with ourselves. If you are struggling with whether you're securing your salvation, could it be because you aren't saved? That's something you need to ask yourself. Now, I've laid out the reasons we can be secure, but if you're wrestling with this, you need to think about this. 1 John 2, verses 3 through 6. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Let me boil it down for you, student, mom, dad. Are you comfortable with sin in your life? Okay, that's it. If there is sin in your life and you are perfectly comfortable with it, there's a problem. You need to ask God to examine your heart. Examine yourself. Uh, second question, uh, second way we answer these questions, um, are you adopted? Okay, can you do anything? So let me ask you this way. Can you do anything that would cause you to stop being your mom and dad's kid? If you are a Christian, God has adopted you as his child. Romans 8 verses 14 through 17 for we, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that way we may also be glorified with him. No, God chose you not because you're perfect, but because he loves you and wanted you. How you might feel doesn't change those facts. So the two questions or objections that might come up as it relates to this idea of being secure, one, if I can't lose myself in does that salvation, does that mean I can do whatever I want? Well, you examine yourself and that answers that question. Because the answer is no. You, you cannot be a Christian and be comfortable with your sin. The two are opposed. Okay? So if you are a follower of Christ, there should be a struggle with your sin. A discomfort. An uneasiness. Okay? Sin should have no part in the life of a Christian. And we should be, as the scripture says, mortifying or putting to death our sinful desires. We should wage war against the passions of the soul, the passions of the flesh, which wage war against our souls. There should be an aggressiveness to our fighting against our sinful desires. That's why Paul uses the analogy in uh, 1 Timothy to endure hardships as a good soldier. That's why we're using the analogy of basic training. There has to be a warfare mindset, okay? So if you are comfortable with your sin, there's a problem, and you really need to ask yourself, have I truly put my faith in Christ? Now, Christians sin, but the Bible says we have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus the righteous. We, the, the scripture says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. I'm not saying as a Christian you don't sin. That's what the Bible teaches. What I'm teaching and communicating from Scripture is that 
Sin should not be at home in the life of a believer. And if it is, there's a problem at the very minimum. And then secondly, if you feel unsure of your salvation, well, your feelings have nothing to do with whether you are secure in your salvation or not. They might be an indicator of something that's wrong, and they may, might not be. I've already alluded to that. So this concept of adoption is very important, and I'm going to uh, close with this uh, illustration for you. Adoption in the Roman world, in which Paul wrote that in Romans chapter 8, is stronger than the adoption that we think of now. So in the Roman world, you could abandon your biological child. So I have four children, uh, all of them biological, none of them adopted. So I could abandon, in the Roman world, legally abandon my children. And that happened a lot, especially to little girls. But in the Roman world, if you adopted someone, you could not abandon them. It was a strong legal transaction. So there was actually a stronger legal bond to adopted children than there was to biological children. And that gives a lot of power to the scriptural teaching on adoption. So when you put your faith in Christ, you are adopted into his family. That is a strong legal word that communicates security. There is nothing you or I can do that can sever that bond. If you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, you can be sure that your salvation is secure. Because of the person of Christ, he doesn't change. He's the one who saves. Because of the promise of the Word of God, God doesn't lie. He promises eternal life to those who put their trust in his Son. And because of the power of God, God is the one who saves. God is the one who keeps. If you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, your life should show it. Therefore, being secure doesn't mean I can do whatever I want. If you say you've trusted Jesus as your Savior and your life doesn't show it, there's a problem. But let me just close by saying, don't let your emotions take control. If you're feeling uncertain of your salvation, reach out to me. Email, text, however, through this YouTube page, through Facebook. Reach out to me and let me help you walk through this. Meditate on Romans 8, verses 31 through 39. Find encouragement and strength and stability in the promises of the Word of God. We can be secure. You can know that you are saved. You can be certain of it because of what God has done for us in Christ. Well, as always, if you have any questions, feel free. Please reach out. Uh, we're here for you. We're praying for you. And we look forward to seeing you again real soon. God bless.